Good afternoon. My name is Duncan Stroik from the School of Architecture at Notre Dame. And on behalf of David Solomon and the Center for Ethics and Culture, I'm pleased to welcome you to the afternoon session on the culture of death and the arts. I think that's why they have an architect here to introduce our two philosophers. I hope I'm not an example of the culture of death and the arts. I'm very pleased to introduce this subject of which the culture of death and the arts, I was thinking that the culture of death in the arts is something I'm very concerned about, as well as the death of culture and the arts. And then I realized that that's what Ralph McInerney is talking about. So our two speakers today, Ralph McInerney and Thomas Hibbs, will speak on this subject. Dr. McInerney is the Michael P. Grace Professor of Medieval Studies, Director of the Jacques Maritain Center at Notre Dame, and has held a number of academic appointments at numerous institutions of higher learning, which I believe is the title of his next book, Institutions of Hired Learning. He is among the many organizations which Dr. McInerney has helped form, found, or in some cases disband. The American Catholic Philosophical Association, Crisis, Journal of Lay Catholic Opinion, Fellowship of Catholic Scholars, International Association of Crime Writers, Hammett, and a related organization, Catholic Dossier, which he is the editor of. He has only written 25 or 26 or 27 books on philosophy and 10 other books on various subjects, including Studies in Analogy, Art and Prudence, First Glance at Thomas Aquinas. This is my favorite handbook for peeping Thomists. Aquinas and Analogy, and a few others. Among his, his, in his free time, he writes murder mystery novels, and this makes up for his lack of publication in the field of philosophy. And I counted 75 books. He corrected me that there's 85, and I now will read to you the, the titles of all of these. <laughs> um, my favorite titles, uh, 1986, Sin Qua Nun. <laughs> 1989, Abra Cadaver. Uh, there's a bunch of nun jokes. I don't know. I mean, nun books. I'm not sure why that is. 1997, uh, his newest uh, Notre Dame series of murder at, on our beautiful campus. On this Rockney, um, the lack of the Irish, and then uh, for those of us who are uh, cardinal files, the uh, red hat. Uh, in his free time, he writes articles, short stories, and lectures. Um, it's also a pleasure to introduce uh, Thomas Hibbs, a specialist in medieval philosophy, ethics, and philosophical theology. Um, he was educated at the University of Dallas with uh, a BA in literature, an MA in philosophy, an MMS in medieval studies at Notre Dame, and a PhD in medieval studies at Notre Dame. Uh, and he is presently associate professor at Boston College I have asked all of his friends uh, if there's anything funny to say about him, and they assure me that he is totally serious and there's nothing, no jokes to be made. Um, among uh, the books that he has written, um, The Practice of Virtue, Aquinas on Contemplation, Action, and the Good Life is forthcoming from Fordham University Press in 1999. And Nihilism... <laughs> Nihilism, American Style, A Study in Popular Culture, uh, which is also forthcoming from Spence Publishing in 1999 as well. Dialectic and Narrative in Aquinas, an Interpretation of the Summa Contra Gentiles. Did I do that okay? Um, University of Notre Dame, 1995. Um, other books that he's edited or introduced, Recovering Nature, uh, Aquinas on Human Nature, and and. Kiridian on Faith, Hope, and Love. Uh, he's written articles in a number of scholarly journals, 
including the Review of Metaphysics, the Thomist, Communio, the Modern Schoolman, International Philosophical Quarterly, American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, New Scholasticism, and we're very happy that he has not yet gotten into murder mystery novels. Uh, please welcome uh, Ralph McInerney and Thomas Hibbs. Well, welcome football fans. <laughs> My topic is the death of culture and the culture of death. Delmore Schwartz has a memorable line, in dreams begin responsibilities. What is true of the individual is true of the culture as well. Imagination is a prelude to action. In this paper, I examine the role literature has played in bringing about the culture of death. That culture rejects the value of every human life and is willing to sacrifice some human life for the benefit of others. Literature both effects and reflects that transition. The works of what are called the Western canon were produced in the cultural ambience of Christendom and thus shared an outlook on human agents and what they are destined for. C.S. Lewis gave it as a bonus of his conversion that he now shared the faith of the authors he studied and taught. Dante, in his dedicatory letter to Con Grande de la Scala, advises that his great poem can be read in the way the Bible is, that is, it has a literal meaning and it has an allegorical meaning. The literal meaning is the state of souls after death. The allegorical meaning is that human beings, by what they freely do, determine their eternal condition, whether of happiness or damnation. The secularization of culture is accompanied by the secularization of the arts. Now, the latter was a long process, but it reaches a culmination in what is called modernity. My thoughts on modern art were stimulated by reading John Kerry's book, The Intellectuals and the Masses, and pursuing various leads that he gives. The thesis is this. Those who sought to kill culture for the common man display a disturbing disposition uh, to want to get rid of the common man as well the common man whom they regard as already dead. When I first read Ortega y Gasset, it was with keen delight. But now when I go back to him, I am appalled by what he has to say and repentant of my early enthusiasm. In a 1948 essay called Dehumanization of Art, Ortega makes explicit the aesthetic implications of his contempt for ordinary folk that was already palpable in the revolt of the masses. That book sounds, in it he sounds like an advance man for Planned Parenthood or zero population growth. He finds that there are just too many people and he regards them with undisguised loathing. I still have the little 35 cent reprint of the book that I bought half a century ago. On its cover one finds this legend with Western populations tripled in the last 100 years, a powerful new phenomenon has arisen, the mass man. Can Western culture survive his encroachments? Will democracy crumble into mediocrity and chaos? The book was published in 1930, and it opens with this scary scenario. Towns are full of people, houses full of tenants, hotels full of guests, trains full of travelers, cafes full of customers, parks full of promenaders, consulting rooms of famous doctors full of patients, theaters full of spectators, and beaches full of bathers. What previously was in general no problem now begins to be an everyday one, namely to find room. That all these people should presume to crowd into the sacred precincts of art is something that must be prevented. And Ortega thinks this is just what modern art has done. On the back cover of my old edition of this book, there is an ironic legend, good reading for the millions. <laughs> <laughs> The Revolt of the Masses was one of the first mass market paperbacks. 
The mark of the modern in any art, Ortega argues, is that it thwarts the expectations of the ordinary man. His point is not that modern art attracts only a few, as if this were merely a contingent fact. Modern art, as he sees it, deliberately repels the many, and that is why reactions to it divide men into, quote, two different varieties of the human species, into two orders or ranks, the illustrious and the vulgar. The majority does not like modern art because it cannot understand it. One can, of course, dislike art that one understands, but something much deeper is involved here. Modern art, Ortega writes, will always have the masses against it. It is essentially unpopular. Moreover, it is anti-popular. And he adds that such art challenges the assumption that men are equal. Prior to modernity in art, the work won over the reader or listener or spectator by engaging his passions and feelings, ordering and interpreting them, sublimating them. But modern art refuses to cater to such vulgarity. The mass of mankind, failing to find any semblance of themselves in the work, are humiliated and filled with a sense of inferiority. Well, it's painful to read this smug, contemptuous essay, and attractive to think that it represents only the bloviations of a philosopher seeking to ally himself with those he conceives to be the cultural elite. But Ortega is on to something. What he purports to see in modern art is there, and it is there because it has been deliberately put there by the artist, at least by some artist. There are, of course, taxonomic difficulties in speaking of modern art as Ortega does. A work will count as modern to the degree that it displays the marks of the modern that Ortega sets forth. Not all works contemporary with what thus counts as modern will themselves be modern. And it's just this that is taken to establish a hierarchy among contemporary artifacts. Those works which display the traits that modern art has superseded will to that degree be popular. And of course, the popular is inferior. It is inferior because it appeals to the mass of mankind and can be understood by them. In any case, it is clear that the art that counts for Ortega is that which makes an effort to be impenetrable by the unwashed, which thwarts the expectations that have been fostered by traditional or classical work, and which presupposes a contempt for the ordinary run of people. Many works exhibit these characteristics, and their makers do indeed share Ortega's disgust with the vulgar. Odi profanum vulgus at Archio? Not quite, I think. Uh, Horace's line is the expression of a reclusive mood, not a policy toward potential readers. Appreciation of the Roman poet is an acquired taste, of course, requiring many skills, but there is nothing in the intricate mosaic of the odes designed to thwart understanding. Horace will conceal his art, but not his meaning. The poet's essential tool, according to Aristotle, is metaphor. I was once nearly run over by a truck in Athens that had metaphora emblazoned on its side. Doubtless it was delivering words to another part of town where they did not literally belong. <laughs> Metaphorain become metaphorically metaphor is the transfer of a word from its native habitat to a surprising and illuminating use. For example, oh, the mind, mind has mountains, or we waited while she passed. It was a narrow time. Or nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, which Dorothy Sayers renders, midway this way of life we're bound upon. The simile is a more overt comparison of one thing to another. When we were children, our papas were stout and colorless as seaweeds or the floats that anchor off New Bedford. Sometimes we have a meta-metaphor at the round earth's imagined corners. Borges has said that words are symbols for shared memories. The metaphor is discursive. It takes us from the thing the word usually or literally means to something else to which perhaps it has never before been applied. Yet we see the point of the transfer. There is the shock of recognition. It tells us something. We learn. If this is true, 
The fundamental and constitutive metaphorical move is from the world in which we live to the world depicted by poet, dramatist, novelist, artist. But the traffic of the internal metaphors is in the opposite direction. More fundamentally, we learn about ourselves. Is this classic view a thing of the past? In his essay, The Role of the Man of Letters in the Modern World, Alan Tate wrote that the artist today must do what he has always done. Quote, he must recreate for his age the image of man, and he must propagate standards by which other men may test that image and distinguish the false from the true. Self-knowledge, according to Tate, then would be the final purpose, the extrinsic end of art. But he adds, men in a dehumanized society may communicate, but they cannot live in full communion. Now, if Ortega is right, what, call, what he calls the modern in art deliberately cuts off contact with the lived world of ordinary folk. It takes away the latter, lest the scarcely literate dare to climb up where they are not wanted. John Kerry has advanced to the convincing argument that the masses so disdained by Ortega and by a surprising array of writers during the period of Kerry studies the masses are an invention of those very writers and of the intellectuals by whom they are influenced. Jacques Barzun enjoined the artist to beware of ideas, of an intellectualism that would stunt him. Uh, the advice came too late for the writer's Perry studies. Perry notes the influence of Nietzsche on the writers who meet Ortega's specification for modern artists. And he finds this fear or threat of the masses uh, are taken to pose in the most surprising authors, in Yeats, uh, in H.G. Wells, in the editor of New Age, in Ibsen, in Knut Hampson. The last ended up celebrating Adolf Hitler. Indeed, the connection between the anti-popular motif of modern art and totalitarianism is a story in itself, and it's both on the left and on the right. F.R. Leva shared the concerns of Ortega, <coughs> fearing that culture faced an unprecedented crisis due to the rise of the mass media. Kerry notes the general contempt for newspapers in the writers he studies and contrasts it with Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, whose knowledge of newspapers is uncondescendingly exhaustive. The great detective's ability to discern the individual by way of common clues strikes Kerry as, quote, residually religious, akin to the singling out of the individual soul, redeemed from the mass that Christianity promises. Now that suggests that there's something unchristian in the contempt for the masses that one finds in Ortega. In Eliot, in D.H. Lawrence, called by Carey the major English disciple of Nietzsche, the mass of people are described as dead. A crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Eliot here borrows Dante's line about the literally dead and applies it to the living London crowds. Lawrence thought that most people are already dead while allegedly alive and opined that another flood that would wipe them out would be nice. An even more frightening thought of Lawrence's is contained in a 1908 letter cited by Carey. I'm quoting now. If I had my way, Lawrence wrote, I would build a lethal chamber as big as the Crystal Palace with a military band playing softly. Then I'd go out in the back streets and main streets and bring them in, all the sick, the halt, and the maimed. I would lead them gently and they would smile me a weary thanks, and the band would softly bubble out the hallelujah chorus. Carey points out that the eugenic society founded in 1907 was dedicated to preventing the increase of inferior breeds, a goal shared, of course, by Margaret Sanger. The epigrammatic effusions of Nietzsche either reflect these views or are the origin of them. Uh, he certainly conferred a kind of respectability on this misanthropy directed at the masses. In the will to power, he envisaged a master race, the new aristocracy, in which the will of philosophical men of power and artist tyrants 
will be made to endure for millennia. Yeats was drawn to eugenics and wrote a little screed on the subject called On the Boiler. D.H. Lawrence despised universal education, which was producing masses of illiterate readers. He wrote, the great mass of humanity should never learn to read and write. Eliot, too, had misgivings about the drive to educate everybody. The growth of colleges and universities was cause for further horror. Eliot wanted the numbers in higher education cut by two-thirds, not expanded. And there are too many books published, he said. He worked for an editor, of course. Out of such fears grew the characteristic note of modernism. It is here that Perry's analysis joins Ortega. The intellectuals could not, Perry writes, could not, of course, actually prevent the masses from attaining literacy, but they could prevent them reading literature by making it too difficult for them to understand. And this is what they did. The early 20th century saw a determined effort on the part of the European intelligentsia to exclude the masses from culture. In England, this movement has become known as modernism. Realism was out, and so was logical coherence. T.S. Eliot wrote that poets in our civilization, as it exists, must be difficult. And Jeffrey Grigson, as editor, sought verse rebarbative to the masses. The means of achieving this was, as Ortega had decreed, to dehumanize art with the aim of taking literacy and culture away from the masses. Well, one who, like myself, was raised on the works of the modernists that Perry has put into such an eerie light must ask if the misanthropic snobbery that is certainly on the page in Ortega and present more often than not merely an obiter dicta of the artist must forever spoil our appreciation of their works. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. The anti-metaphors of Eliot rang in one's mind long before he realized that their meaning was not just difficult, but perhaps non-existent. Did I ever understand the line, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream? Does anyone? Does Wallace Stephen? Does it matter? Uh, Hugh Kenner, one of the keenest of critics and proponents of the modern, presents it mainly as artful fun. He revels in the techniques, the verbal ledger domain of the modern, and one detects no sense at all of anything sinister beneath the difficult. The Pound Era may be Kenner's best book. It is full of delights, the delights of the delighted, and is carried by a couple of bad arguments. Uh, in a chapter called Words Set Free, Kenner relishes the Wittgensteinian thought that language is a little world made cunningly without need of meanings that link it with the real world, telling us all this in a language that ignores, as it must, the thesis. What are Kenner's bad arguments? This, he said, we read in Cymbeline, in Cymbeline these were lines, golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. The metaphors seem obvious. Youth is to gold as age is to dust. So for generations the lines were read until a visitor to Warwickshire heard a boy refer to dandelions as golden boys. And what are they called when they go to seed, he was asked, chimney sweepers. And that is what they look like. So what is Kenner's argument? That the lines that had long been misunderstood could now be understood aright? Kenner is after much more, and he finds it in Ezra Pound. The symbolist revolution, he wrote, allowed Pound to know that there would still be poetry for the reader who could not fill the ellipses back in, who literally, therefore, did not know what many words meant, or even for the reader who filled them in wrong. But one might say, if golden lads and chimney sweepers receive new meaning, it is as specific to the more generic. Golden youth is to dandelions as chimney sweepers are to dust. And how generalized could Kenner's point be made? Could one respond to a poem while understanding none of its meaning? Well, Eliot tells us that he read Dante long before he understood Italian, and surely he could have appreciated the music of the lions, 
but can an element of the poetic serve as the whole? Eliot eventually learned Italian, after all. Now, I should like to save the moderns from Ortega's and Perry's characterization of them, at least in large part, and do so by suggesting that there is a spectrum on which the modern may be located, which connects it to artifacts designed to attract rather than repel readers. And I'm going to suggest that the modern is not as repellent as it allegedly wished to be. When C.S. Lewis, Lewis, an experiment in criticism, uh, began his discussion of what literature is, uh, he proposed this as a rule of thumb. Literature is anything that you would read again. Now, that, of course, excludes everything that would be merely read once, if at all. But why should we read anything again? This is what he leads us to ask. Now, Aristotle held that the soul of the tragedy is its plot. It is plot that provides a beginning, a middle, and end of the events enacted on the stage. Fundamental as it is to fiction, generalizing from tragedy to all narrative fiction, the plot alone is not likely to bring us back again to a story, a novel, or a play. Once we know how it comes out, who done it, for example, the story loses its interest for us if plot is all. But of course, plot is the vehicle of other elements of a fictional creation. There is character, speech, setting, alien lore, and through all these, the plot conveys not just a well-rounded action, but a meaningful action. Finally, it is because, to whatever degree, a story tells us something about ourselves and the mystery of the acting person that we return to it. In fiction, each great writer has a distinctive voice, a distinctive outlook, a manner in which to interpret the human actions he puts before our eyes. And it is for that, above all, for its distinctive interpretation of human life that we especially go back to certain word, works. What Lewis' <coughs> suggestion enables us to see is that there is a spectrum on which we locate works of art, narrative art. At one end, the lowest end, there are stories that are merely entertaining, uh, diverting, a good read. Elmore Leonard can serve as an example. Has anyone ever reread an Elmore Leonard novel? I'm thinking of the swift and dirty below the belt novels that have made him a millionaire, not the wonderful westerns. Uh, that aren't sufficiently read, like Valdez is coming. But uh, I'm thinking of Elmore Leonard, the one that makes the best seller of those. Those novels that make it as literature on Lewis's simple criterion are not all of a piece, of course. Not all works of literature are of equal value, nor do many of them make it into the Western canon. There are some works that are literally inexhaustible, read and reread, not just by one generation, but by generation after generation. At the high end of the spectrum, uh, there is something approaching consensus on what is truly great, hence their canonical status. No one would confine his readings to these works, and Lewis's Catholic criterion enables us to enjoy without apology the poor cousins of the canonical works because they share to varying degrees that more than mere plot that brings us back to them. Now, such a view of literature discourages the notion that there is some deep chasm between the works that fall toward one end of the spectrum and those that fall near the other. There is a continuum the reader travels back and forth upon, recognizing the qualitative differences between works of literature, but not anathematizing works which just barely make it onto the continuum. Children's books are the usual introduction to reading, and some of them deserve the Appalachian literature by the Lewis criteria. The child that learns to love them will be disposed to move on up the continuum to more rewarding books. But what adult does not return to Huckleberry Finn and Kidnap again and again over the years, long after the children to whom he read them are reading them to his own? It is just these considerations <clears throat> that enable us to place works of what Ortega would call modern art on, the, on that spectrum uh, and read them despite the apparent intention of their authors to make them unreadable. 
some of his some of the poetry that Hugh Pinner celebrates is unlikely to be thought equal to the canonical works of poetry. But for all that, they have elements of the poetic in them. A poem in which the music of the language drowns out all meaning continues to instantiate an essential element of poetic language, measured and melodic sound. But are their meanings really indecipherable? Do critics of Pound go on and on about the meaninglessness of the cantos? Of course not. Is Ulysses impenetrable? Finnegan's Wake almost succeeds in thwarting every effort to understand it, but shells groan under the weight of books that offer us its key. The modern may deliver up its meaning reluctantly and with difficulty, but that it is essentially esoteric, as Ortega suggests, seems doubtful. But then perhaps his point is made if it is only sufficiently difficult to turn away most readers, but that is not unintelligibility per se. But we're still left with the data provided us with, uh, by John Perry and the theory advanced by Ortega. The depiction of ordinary folks in the novels and poems Carey scrutinizes is indeed misanthropic. People are seen as dead, depressed, absurd, subhuman. Eliot's ape neck Sweeney displays the anti-Irish animus of the poet's milieu, first in Boston and then England. Lawrence can hardly contain his contempt for the masses. And it's significant, of course, that both Eliot and Lawrence lament the increase of literacy. What use can louts make of this skill except to read newspapers and other trash? Well, about that, two things. First, if modernism sought to break the link between the popular and the difficult, withholding its high art from the masses, this created the conditions in which shock and trash could flourish, shock and trash produced, for the most part, by the elite. Second, the masses, in a more serious sense, are not merely a foil for the modern artist. They are the public expression of the individualism of which many have spoken uh, from this uh, podium. The atomization of society ends in little more than an aggregate of autonomous units and the weakening of the sense of the common good. And this threatens the shared memories that words symbolize. The arts become the manipul manipulation of the many by some, just as philosophers aspire to become strong poets that is, to impose their ungrounded outlooks on others. The mass media address us one by one, appealing to passion and desire. This is the situation Kierkegaard foresaw and deplored in the present age. And Trollope often groused about the times, alias the Jupiter. This was not contempt for the common man, but for those who would manipulate him. The ultimate telos of this manipulation is titillation pornography. I want to end on a cheerful note. <clears throat> <laughs> Faulkner, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, made the famous uh, declaration, man will prevail. And what everyone makes of this as a prophecy, it suggests the fundamental policy of the artist, certainly the novelist. He, as Ellen Tate made clear, is involved in interpreting his reader to himself pondering and elucidating the mystery of the human person as it is revealed in the imagined contingencies of, of choice and decision. The greatest novels provide the richest variety of human virtue and folly, and across the spectrum, from such definitive works as War and Peace, I Promessi Sposi, Moby Dick, through Jane Austen and Fitzgerald and James and Willa Cather, to those millions of works which merely entertain, entertain, not titillate, there is an undoubted declension. But there is as well the possibility that the more than mere entertainment found even in popular art will lead the reader toward more rewarding works. Isn't there hope in the fact that such great works never go out of print? Trollope and Dickens may be read more now than they were in their lifetimes. And the same could be said of dozens of others. Was Henry James ever so popular as he is today? Film and television adaptations of the best of stories find their audience, but works which were fashioned to repel continue, continue to do so and end up etherized on the impatient deconstructionist table. 
the phrase critical mass takes on ironic meaning. <clears throat> the unreadable is not read. But reading goes on in all its varieties, and I console myself with a thought that I hope is not too fanciful, a thought encouraged by the continuing appeal of the kind of works the modern sought to replace. Literature may be able to provide some antidote to the culture of death. For, of course, the old tradition has continued unbroken into our own day. Flannery O'Connor, reflecting on her writing, recalled the remark St. Cyril of Jerusalem made to catechumens. The dragon sits by the side of the road, watching those who pass. Beware lest he devour you. We go to the father of souls, but it is necessary to pass by the dragon. And this is her comment on that. No matter what form the dragon may take, it is of this mysterious passage past him or into his jaws that stories of any depth will always be concerned to tell. And this being the case, it requires considerable courage at any time in any country not to turn away from the storyteller. which image there at the end I should pick up on. But I think that the word declension, more than an image, might uh, uh, be descriptive of the transition from that last talk to what I'm about to give you presently. Uh, consider this comic, mid-afternoon comic relief with a brief tour into the jaws of the dragon. <laughs> Uh, in Hollywood versus America, popular culture and the war on traditional values, the film critic Michael Medved argues that over the past few decades, Hollywood has engaged in a sustained assault on the values held sacred by most Americans. From its disdainful attitude toward religion, to its depiction of parents and other authority figures as conniving egoists or bumbling dolts, Hollywood exhibits an entrenched antipathy toward traditional institutions. Even a brief encounter with Hollywood culture, for example, in the boorish political diatribes that have become a staple of the Academy Awards show, support Medved's suspicions about the political leanings of Hollywood elites. But what Medved seems to miss is the nihilistic tenor of so much contemporary TV and film, which undercuts not only conservative or mainstream American political positions, but also the standard assumptions of the left, assumptions concerning human dignity and the rationality of a liberal political order. What Medved identifies as Hollywood's primary target is quite often merely an incidental object of derision. And in this, Medved is impeded from seeing what we might learn from contemporary film and television. One of the things that we might learn has to do with a subtle but intimate link between a certain form of liberalism and nihilism. Now, nihilism has been depicted in a variety of ways, perhaps the most famous of which comes from Nietzsche, who holds that nihilism is the devaluation of the highest values. Setting aside for the moment Nietzsche's genealogy of Western morality, we can say that for him the arrival of nihilism coincides with the recognition that all moral codes are contingent and arbitrary. There is no longer any basis for distinguishing higher from lower, better from worse, good from evil. The most pervasive form of nihilism, what Nietzsche calls passive nihilism, is embodied in the petty aspirations of the last man whose life lacks any ultimate purpose or fundamental meaning and a response to the great questions of human life with a blink and a giggle. But it is not just Nietzsche who speaks of the nihilistic possibilities latent within modern civilization. Although different from Nietzsche in important and instructive ways, similar analysis can be found in Tocqueville and Arendt. And profoundly Catholic authors like Walker Persery and Flannery O'Connor also voice concerns about the diminution of modern humanity, although their diagnoses and cures differ markedly from those of their secular counterparts. 
Recall Percy's Lancelot, whose main character embarks on a quest for evil, the unholy grail, the sole quest left for those who inhabit a world where everyone is either wonderful or sick. Even more succinct and direct is the statement of Flannery O'Connor, who writes in one of her letters, if you live today, you breathe in nihilism. In or out of the church, it's the gas you breathe. One of the most astute contemporary examinations of nihilism can be found in James Edwards' book, The Plain Sense of Things, The Fate of Religion in an Age of Normal Nihilism. Edwards asserts that, quite confidently, we are all now nihilists, leading lives constituted by self-devaluing values. A hangover from our religious and philosophical history, our nihilistic culture is best described for Edwards as a sort of regional shopping mall where human life is reduced to lifestyle choices for rootless consumers. While Edwards' genealogical account of how we arrived at the present predicament he describes is open to serious question, his depiction of nihilism as a condition where choices are reduced to mere preferences finds striking confirmation in some popular film and TV shows, where nihilism is often depicted as flowing naturally from the exaltation of choice, from the absolutizing of individual autonomy. In what follows, I will trace the link between a certain conception of choice or autonomy on the one hand and nihilism on the other in two films and one TV series. First, the 1996 film Train Spotting, a drug film, which is set in Scotland but plays off a vision of American commercialism and freedom that has become a cultural icon for too much of the world. Second, the sitcom Seinfeld, the most popular American sitcom of the 90s. I'm going to talk briefly about those two. And third, I'll talk a little bit in greater detail about the recent film, The Cider House Rules, which was nominated for seven Academy Awards this past year. First, Train Spotting. Stars Ewan McGregor as Renton. It's a thoroughly comic and unabashed celebration of drug use as a way of life. In the opening voiceover, Renton subverts the drug-free slogans proclaimed by parents, school teachers, and politicians the world over. He does so by making hyperbolic use of the term choice which he turns against those who at one moment exalt choice above all else, and then in the next moment initiate a campaign of just say no to drugs. Here is his deliciously ironic opening soliloquy, uh, edited for prime time. <laughs> choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career. Choose a family. Choose a blank and big television. Choose washing machines, cars, compact disc players. Choose good health, low cholesterol, and dental insurance. Choose fixed interest mortgage payments. Choose a starter home. Choose your friends. Choose leisure wear and matching fabrics. Choose a future. Choose life. You could do that, but why would I want to do a thing like that? Retton concludes, I choose not to choose life. And why not? In a world where choice is an end in itself, a world where, as Nietzsche puts it, the question why finds no answer, one choice is as good as any other. Anticipating his audience's demand for a reason for his choice, Renton asserts there are no reasons. Who needs reasons when you've got heroin? The drug-free world thinks heroin is all about misery and despair and all that other stuff. But what they forget is the pleasure of it. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. We're not stupid. On this point, Renton meets the drug-free world on its own turf, or at least a portion of that world on its own turf, if the law-abiding world has any vision of the good life in light of which it makes its daily calculations and choices, in this film at least, that vision has to do with pleasure, especially as found in sex and the petty consumerist delights of consumption. Given the infiltration of sexual titillation into nearly all aspects of contemporary life, Renton's boast on behalf of heroin is impressive. Take the best sexual experience you've ever had, multiply its pleasure by a thousand, and you still won't equal the pleasure of heroin. The means deployed by ordinary citizens to achieve pleasure are replete with frustrations and afford only tepid satisfaction. By contrast, a sincere drug habit clarifies things <laughs> and simplifies the quest for pleasure. Renton and his cohorts have made their own rational calculations about the best means of achieving pleasure. At one point in the film, they described their group decision to go back on drugs as a fully informed democratic choice. Renton's cleverness and verbal resourcefulness allow him to turn the language of choice and informed consent against the anti-drug law-abiding citizens. The principal drawback, he says, to a life of addiction 
is the ranting moralistic preaching from straight family and friends who criticize him for polluting his body and wasting his life. But Renton's life is depicted in this film as more dynamic, more pleasure-filled than is the life of drug-free citizens. And if the highest aspirations of liberal society concern accumulation and bodily health, and its heroism peaks at saying no to drugs, then Renton's fearless, if reckless, affirmation of the pleasures and risks of heroin looks almost noble by comparison. In the film's concluding scene, Renton and his cronies successfully plot out and execute a plan to purchase drugs cheap and sell them for profit. Renton manages to abscond with all the profits, admitting in his final soliloquy that he has no good reason for cheating his co-conspirators, except that each of them would have done the same thing to him if given the opportunity. Then as he walks off with his duffel bag full of cash, he faces the camera and with a wry grin offers the following reassuring words. So why did I do it? I could offer a million answers, all false. The truth is that I'm a bad person, but that's going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going straight and choosing life. I'm going to be just like you. I'm looking forward to it already. The job, the family, the big television, children, walks in the park, nine to five, good at golf, washing the car, choice of sweaters, family Christmas, indexed pension, tax exemption, clearing gutters, getting by, looking ahead, the day you die. The film is most obviously a satire of capitalist consumerism, but it cuts more deeply than that. It undermines not just capitalism, but a founding principle of radical liberalism, free to choose. Renton's subversive deployment of the language of choice might be captured in the slogan, dare to say yes to drugs. One is not entirely surprised to discover that nihilism makes possible these sort of darkly comic and mildly subversive narratives. What is striking about so many of the contemporary narratives that have a touch of nihilism or more to them is their utter conventionality. Indeed, this is precisely the effect that one would expect nihilism eventually to have. For if nihilism becomes an unspoken assumption, then rebellion comes to seem as silly as the conventions the rebel would have us protest. Conventional, or what James Edwards calls normal nihilism, is nowhere more accurately illustrated or more humorously played out than on the sitcom Seinfeld, a show you may recall about nothing. Two of the more noteworthy episodes of that series offered humorous send-ups of contemporary debates about abortion and euthanasia. In the first, two of the main characters, Jerry and Elaine, are having dinner at Poppy's restaurant as Elaine enthusiastically describes a handsome guy she's just met. Aware that Elaine is pro-choice and unwilling to allow her to enjoy even a moment of potential happiness, her good friend Jerry calmly inquires where the new guy in her life stands on the question of abortion. With mounting apprehension in her voice, Elaine says, well, I just assumed he's pro-choice. I mean, he's so good looking. Jerry's enjoyment increases when he, it turns out he's not pro-choice. Jerry's enjoyment increases when he manages to incite a near riot in the restaurant by involving the customers and the owner in a raucous shouting match over abortion. Later in the same episode, Kramer attempts to interest Poppy, who owns this restaurant, in a new restaurant, a pizza shop where customers make their own pizza. The joint project runs into quick trouble when Poppy objects to Kramer's idea that customers should be free to choose their own toppings. Poppy indignantly responds, on this topic, there can be no debate. Further discussion centers on the question, when a pizza becomes a pizza, when it comes out of the oven or when you first put your hands in the dough. The episode plays upon the irrational and shrill character that so often plagues our public debate over abortion. But it's deeper than this. It mocks both sides in the debate and depicts morality itself as farce. In another episode, the impetuous Kramer watches the first part of a video in which the main character falls into a coma. This story makes Kramer anxious to write up a living will to ensure that he will die with dignity. Before he settles on Elaine as the most trustworthy proxy among his friends, he considers Jerry, who promises him, if given the legal opportunity, I will kill you. <laughs> During one of Kramer and Elaine's visits to the lawyer, they entertain various scenarios for the ending of Kramer's life. To one hypothetical situation, you're eating, but machines do everything else, Elaine advises, I'd stick. Kramer says, yeah, I could still go to the coffee shop. After all this planning, Kramer returns to the video only to learn that the woman emerges from the coma to resume her life. When Jerry later asks about the status of his living will, 
Kramer sloughs it off. I've changed my mind about the whole coma thing. I'm up for it. Seinfeld is a world where the lives of the main characters lack any fundamental purpose or ultimate meaning, where the distinction between better and worse ways of life has vanished. Many episodes demonstrate the comic absurdity of making an absolute out of choice, out of mere human preference, the consequence of which is the trivialization of all acts of choosing, as one's vag vagrant appetites and migratory preferences alter from moment to moment, so too does one's thinking about the ultimate issues. The absence of any larger framework in light of which one might appraise one's options effectively divests the big questions of significance. While by no means defending the traditional values of which Medved speaks, it seems to me that neither Trainspotting nor Seinfeld can be said to side with mainstream liberalism. Instead, they pro provide intentionally comic illustrations of human life in a world where all choices have indeed been reduced to mere preferences. By contrast, the recent film The Cider House Rules, a film gleefully embraced by Planned Parenthood, is an unambiguous and unambivalent defense would be too generous a word, I think, of the mainstream liberal position on abortion. Based on a novel and screenplay by John Irving, The Cider House Rules is the story of St. Cloud's Orphanage in Maine whose director, Dr. Larch, played very effectively by Michael Caine, who received a Best Supporting Actor Award for his part. Dr. Larch not only cares for the orphans, but also delivers babies or aborts them, depending upon the wishes of the distraught women who come to the orphanage. Among the orphans is Homer Wells, who after two failed attempts at adoption, ends up a long-term long resident of the orphanage. Homer becomes Dr. Larch's protege, helping the doctor to care for the younger orphans and helping him to deliver babies. Despite Larch's persistent harangues, Homer resists performing abortions. Uncertain about his future, Homer eventually sets out on his own, leaving the orphanage with a couple who had visited to have an abortion. He takes a job in an apple orchard and lives in the cider house with the rest of the workers. In the film's culminating scenes, Homer faces a dilemma, whether to perform an abortion of a pregnancy resulting from incest. Once he performs the abortion, which he does, his vocation becomes clear. He must return to the orphanage to replace Dr. Larch, who has just died, but who managed prior to his death to orchestrate Homer's hiring as his replacement at St. Cloud's. Some film critics describe the Cider House rules as a coming-of-age story in which Homer learns which rules are to be broken and which not. But it's not clear from the film precisely how we are to distinguish between the breakable and unbreakable rules. At one point, Dr. Larch states, with each rule that I make or break, I try to keep in mind that my first priority is an orphan's future. Some vague standard of compassion seems to be operative, but there's no evidence in the film that there are any rules that ought never to be broken, and this is in keeping with the sentimental utilitarianism of the film. Larch repeatedly counsels Homer that he must do something useful with his life. When Homer objects that he doesn't want to play God, Larch responds that men of conscience should seize the opportunity to play God, since that opportunity is rare. But Larch goes on to downplay his own role, arguing that he doesn't even recommend what choice the troubled pregnant visitors to the orphanage should make. He just, to quote, gives them what they want. The film is all about decisions and choices, becoming useful and giving people what they want. Dr. Larch's opening voiceover states, here at St. Cloud's, not even the decision to get off the train is easy because it presupposes an earlier and more difficult decision. Add a child to your life or leave one behind. I'll allow you to note that the leave one behind is, you, there are two ways you can leave one behind at the orphanage. The central decision of the film, resisted until the film's final segments, is the choice of Homer to perform an abortion. In some reviews, the young Homer's refusal to do abortions has been described as philosophical, but it would be more accurately described as personal. He's the first of, first representative of I'm personally opposed but. He doesn't want to perform abortions himself, but he has no problem with Dr. Larch performing them. So his opposition is personal and conventional. His strongest argument is it's against the law. Yet Larch, who repeatedly and vehemently insists we must give people the freedom to make decisions for themselves, makes an exception to that rule in the case of Homer. Instead of respecting the judgment of Homer's conscience, he berates him and assigns to him the task of disposing of the remains of aborted babies in the incinerator at the cider house, excuse me, at the orphanage. Scenes like these, 
along with the numerous depictions of Dr. Larch putting himself to sleep each night by inhaling ether and then eventually dying from an overdose of ether, seek to capture the gravity of the issues and choices involved in the question of the morality and legality of abortion. But Irving's desire to treat these choices seriously competes with and quickly loses to another desire to demonstrate the silliness, the coldness, the maliciousness of any opposition to abortion. Since significant and weighty issues are always open to serious debate among serious people, the safest way and surest way to forestall opposition, at least in our culture it seems, is to treat an issue as something so trivial that anyone who opposes it looks silly and foolish. How does the Cider House Rules do this with respect to abortion? Two ways. First, the title of the film refers to a list of rules posted inside the Cider House, rules to which the illiterate workers are oblivious until Homer arrives, that they're, they're all uh, a group of black workers who come seasonally to the Cider House to pick apples and make cider, and they can't read. But when Homer shows up, he reads the rules. When he reads the first rule, prohibiting smoking in bed, those assembled laugh as they turn to one of their co-workers sitting on his bed, smoking. One of the workers comments, we didn't make those rules. They don't have anything to do with us. Later in the film, Homer reads the rest of the rules, many of which prohibit various activities on the roof of the cider house. That's important. This discussion of the rules prohibiting activity on the, on the roof of the cider house immediately precedes the most important sequence of events in the film. Here they are. Rose Rose one of the workers, the sole female worker in the cider house, admits she's pregnant and that the father of the child is her own father. Realizing that she is unwilling to have the child, Homer attempts to persuade her to travel to St. Cloud's for an abortion. She counters that her father would never let her leave and tells Homer, I'll take care of things myself. Feel fearing that she will end up butchered, Homer decides this is his great moment decides to perform the abortion himself. As soon as the abortion is completed, an enraged Rose enacts revenge on her father, stabbing him fatally. Immediately after this sequence of events, the camera shifts perspective. Panoramic view of the cider house ensconced in the glorious colors of a New England autumn. On the roof of the cider house stand the workers, offering a good-humored protest against the rules. This scene, which provoked hearty laughter from the audience in the theater where I first saw the film, has the effect of trivializing the entire debate about rules, and thus provides a remarkable, a remarkably striking instance of the way the exaltation of choice, giving people what they want, effectively evacuates choices of their significance. If Seinfeld treats views about abortion as equivalent to preferences for pizza toppings, the Cider House Rules places laws against abortion on the same plane with rules about standing on rooftops. Someone might argue that this interpretation places inordinate weight on one lighthearted scene, an innocuous protest against a silly rule. But Irving forces us to look at this scene. The very title of the film underscores the importance of the rules on the wall of the Cider House. And we cannot fail to notice the location, although I should add this, if you rent the video, that scene is out. It's in, it's in the film that he received the uh, Academy Award for, but that scene of the workers on the roof is out. It's interesting to speculate why. But we cannot fail to notice the location of this scene. Following a series of intense and brutal events and Homer's moment of self-realization, a moment toward which the whole plot has been building. The second way in which the film trivializes choice in order to support its pro-choice message is the film's more general treatment of rules. It's universal and flippant justification of lying. So many lies are told and justified in the film that it's hard to keep track of all. Indeed, I, I lost track. Here's a limited sample. First, on the basis of an x-ray inserted into his medical fire at St. Cloud's, Homer grows up thinking he has a bad heart. It turns out that Dr. Larch has substituted an image of someone else's defective heart in order to make sure that Homer could not be drafted into the war. Dr. Larch, it seems, couldn't bear the prospect of losing his beloved Homer. The context is important here. This isn't the Gulf War or even Vietnam. This is World War II. Second, when the advisory board of the orphanage forces Larch to think about a replacement for him 
he falsifies degrees and other documents to make Homer the viable candidate. Third, after the most sympathetic child from the orphanage, Fuzzy, this is the child we see on screen a lot, dies from an ailment he has had since birth, Larch secretly enlists the assistance of one of the older orphan boys to bury Fuzzy's body. As the boy helps cover the secret gravesite, Larch tells him in a firm and peremptory turn, tone that under no conditions will he tell the other orphans that Fuzzy has died. Tell them he was adopted, Larch commands. When the boy skeptically questions whether the kids will believe such a story about Fuzzy, whose illness had always proven an obstacle to adoption, Larch responds curtly, they'll believe it because they want to believe it. Fourth, after Rose Rose has her abortion and stabs her father, he lies dying and counsels witnesses to say that he has committed suicide. In the most explicit statement of the mantra of the film, he says, sometimes you have to break a few rules to set things right. Despite the grim realities with which the film deals, the tone in the end is not bleak, but hopeful and uplifting. In the final scene, guaranteed to make viewers misty-eyed, a smiling horde of kids rushes to welcome Homer back to St. Clouds. At this point, we are apt to forget what made Homer's return possible. The logic of the film stipulates that it's only after Homer performs an abortion that he can go home again. It seems to be saying that the only people who can really help the orphans are those who are committed to a policy of abortion on demand. And it is the shouts of the children, the spunky, sad, happy, forlorn, joyful, adorable children that mesmerize the audience and win our hearts. These scenes have their desired emotional effect, provoking the sighing responses, gee, aren't they cute, and oh, isn't it sad. Then there is Dr. Larch's nightly benediction to the orphans. Good night, you princes of Maine, you kings of New England. For a culture raised on CNN sympathy, this is sufficient to win over the audience and repress any thought that those who care for these children could be capable of wrongdoing. Just as the orphanage is a front for Larch's abortion mill, so too are the orphans a front for Irving's strident pro-abortion message. Thus does the exaltation of choice and autonomy give rise to the sentimental nihilism at the core of the Cider House rules. Thank you. We have about five minutes for comments or questions. Uh, an anecdote and then a request for commentary from both uh, speakers. The anecdote is uh, when the Cider House Rules came out, Notre Dame uh, invited John Irving to come and read from it in the sophomore literary festival. Uh, I was here as a graduate student at that time. The uh, commentary I appreciate from both speakers is about a probably the most recent phenomenon of popular culture and literature. Uh, the Harry Potter books. Uh, there's an interesting phenomenon going on there in this sense that on the one hand, you have uh, Christ cr some Christians objecting to the Harry Potter books because of the sorcery and magic and the, the uh, mythological creatures and so on. And on the other hand, you have the sort of elite literary critics not quite willing to say they're bad, right? Uh, but somewhat snidely suggesting, well, so many damn people are reading them and rereading them, they can't be that good. But what I was struck uh, by, and this, this is where it sort of ties in, I think, with the themes you've been pursuing, is uh, in the climax of the first novel, you have Lord Voldemort, whose name, of course, means wish for death, uh, confronting Harry and um, simply stating to him, as Harry wonders why he's going to be killed here, uh, stating to him, "There, I, I hope I get this right, there is no good and evil, just power and those who have the will to use it. And I'm just wondering if you would, if you might have something to say about that phenomenon, both the theme and then the ph phenomenon of the books. Yeah, I think it's interesting that when uh, I, I think of an essay of Camus uh, that appeared after the war called L'Art Absurd. And uh, he was uh, analyzing uh, the possibility of telling a novel or writing a novel that would have the message that there is no message. And he said, of course, it's impossible because that would be the message. And it seems to me what, what Tom has made clear is that 
the vehicle uh, that uh, seemingly overcomes nihilism is actually pushing uh, for uh, a, uh, a, a particular point. Perhaps you'd say it's a nihilistic point, but it's, it's certainly not, uh, it's not something neutral. But uh, maybe Camus has a point that uh, it would be impossible to have a meaningful narrative, the meaning of which was that it's meaningless. I, I love the Harry Potter books. I think they're terrific. I mean, you you uh, mentioned the the Voldemort, who's the the bad guy. Um, Harry, of course, at that at the end of that first book, is saved. His parents are killed, and he is saved. And we learn. Uh, well, I mean, he, he was saved before that, but the, the the part that you're talking about is described at the end. But uh, he's told that it was his mother's love that saved him, right? So it made him invulnerable to the hatred and malice of Voldemort. And I think uh, throughout those books, I mean, I think it's great that kids are reading those things and the kids are reading big, long books. It's it's, uh, it's an astonishing phenomenon to me. And I've read all of them, and I, I don't have any serious objection. I'm not too worried about the, the way magic is depicted precisely because it's framed in this larger context of the issue of virtue and goodness versus a sort of will to power, right, where the only thing is power. And it's quite clear... Uh, who the bad guys are in these books, uh, and that uh, it takes friendship, commitment to a, a common good, which these kids can't fully articulate to themselves, but somehow instinctively they understand, and they're forced to articulate it as they face various evil enemies. So I think that, I think these books are uh, the terrific models. I mean, C.S. Lewis used, you know, the, the, the two different kinds of magic uh, that he talks about, and the deeper magic, right? Um, I, I haven't read these well enough to figure out whether this is following a similar line, but it seems to me on the question of, of goodness versus evil uh, that, that these books are, are, are admirable. Oh, um, a uh, question especially following on uh, Thomas Hibbs' last remarks. I'm wondering if there might be a typology or a zoology of monsters. Some dragons in need of slaying, some dragons in need of taming. The reason I would introduce this is it would seem that this second type, the dragons in need of slain, follow along the lines of the sort of monsters that um, Professor McInerney's paper was addressing, things that really seem to lead towards a form of nihilism. The dragons in need of taming, it would seem to me, might be works in which one's moral imagination and moral reasoning is critically engaged, and as a classic example, like, would mention a movie like Train Spotting. I mean, it would seem to me that two informed critics could engage about the extent to which that's a, I mean, I think you said all a pro-drug movie. I mean, to me, that's a pro-drug movie in the way that the Iliad is like a you know, yeah. pro-violence yeah. novel or something like that. And now, that's not to say that I think that that movie is appropriate for all viewers. In no sense would I make that claim. But especially in, with the remarks about the Harry Potter books, it would seem to me that these are things that we have to be careful and we have to engage with, with our abilities as much as possible, but that they can't be consigned to the same sort of dragons that um, perhaps are in need of slaying rather than taming. Well, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and when I say it's pro-drug, I mean to add the, the words that I was saying about it being ironic and, and thoroughly comic. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's a film, although I have heard from students that in the drug subculture on campuses, it's usually popular. Uh, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That mean that may just mean that it sort of gets the drug world right in its description. It doesn't seem to me, and Seinfeld the same way. It doesn't seem to me that Train Spotting or Seinfeld are things that people could watch. I mean, you're in really bad shape if you're watching those things, and you think, gee, I could be happy if I inhabited this world. Uh, it, it strikes me that there are other uh, main more mainstream TV shows that are more insidious because the beautiful people are on them. And the morality that's there is basically the same bankrupt morality as Seinfeld, but it's not clear that it looks so attractive. Friends would be an example of this, I think. Uh, so I think you're right. I think a film like Train Spotting is unlikely to uh, to have the effect of leading people, seducing them into evil. Uh, and and so I think you're right. I think it's a film, and Seinfeld too. I think that's a show that that invites a kind of critical engagement. I mean, the satirical take in those lines I was reading: "Choose this, choose that." It's, it, that's, it's right on the surface that this is a kind of satire. I have a very strange question, but of course I'm a Texan. 
Uh, and it was provoked by some discussions with Gil Myland, and I usually learn from him. He was asking me a question. Uh, why do you think uh, there's so much interest in forbidding capital punishment? When we talk about forbidding abortion, we don't get much of an audience. And when we talk about uh, really getting people to understand uh, what euthanasia's evils are, we don't cut deep in the culture. Uh, but I wonder if the interest in proscribing uh, capital punishment isn't in isn't overdetermined. I mean, as an Orthodox Christian, I have uh, uh, a view that all taking of all human life. Our society doesn't want to think about. And one of the reasons that uh, it becomes overly attractive, it's attractive perhaps both to Christians and then also to nihilists, uh, because a society shouldn't have anything that has a ceremony uh, of uh, what takes place before someone is executed, which is to remark about the very seriousness of life. And this, because of that seriousness, the person will be executed. I was recalling to uh, Gil Myland uh, that just before you're executed in Texas, two Texas Rangers come in and tell you, uh, on so-and-so night you killed Bubba, uh, and you did it in cold blood, and for his death, you will now die. And I wonder if that doesn't tie some of your remarks to some of our reflections about the culture of death, for even the death uh, that we exact in capital punishment can no longer have the significance it once did in our culture. I stood up before just to prove I still could. I didn't realize <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, there, are, there are several ways, obviously, to be against capital punishment. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that it's possible for a Catholic uh, to allow that it, it's licit under certain circumstances and still be wholeheartedly with the Holy Father in, uh, in uh, agitating against uh, the states availing itself of that right. But I think in the process of doing that, and I, I think this may be your point, we find ourselves allied with people uh, for whom the seriousness of human action uh, just does not exist, the notion that there are consequences of what we do uh, and that we might have to pay penalties for it. We find, I think punishment itself uh, or, or holding people responsible is very often what underlies a certain kind of opposition uh, to capital punishment. And I think we have to be care careful of the company we keep uh, in uh, following the lead of, uh, of the Holy Father. One last quick question or comment, Father. Sure. Um, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Uh, if that's true, if we're called to have joy, uh, and if joy presupposes that we have hope, uh, being awash in cultures uh, of nihilism, where do you see the seeds of, uh, of this hope that we're called to? That's, is, who's that directed to? Anyone. <laughs> You're the hopeful one. <laughs> architecture. It's an architecture. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that, uh, I mean, there are hopeful narratives. I, I picked a few that, that actually seem to me to illustrate a, a, something like what the Pope is saying in, in the Gospel of Life, that that once autonomy comes to mean choice that shall not be uh, reined in by any principle of truth whatsoever, once you separate freedom utterly from truth, this is the sort of thing that can develop out of that. And it seems to me that recognizing that, seeing it in our culture, is actually something that we can learn from. I mean, you're forced to make very tough judgments, it seems to me, about a lot of what's going on in the culture. Uh, if you do see that. But that can be the beginning of a kind of hope because you have to then ask yourself sort of dialectically, and this is what I do when I work on this stuff with students, you have to ask yourself kind of dialectically, well, on what grounds am I resisting this? And, and that seems to me that that's the beginning of philosophy. And, and that is that, that philosophical quest is rooted in a kind of natural hope, not supernatural. And so at, as a philosopher, that's my goal in working on this stuff. It seems to me that even the most nihilistic sort of stuff out there has a kind of narrative structure to it. 
and you can see where it starts and why, at least internally, it ends up where it does. And if you make judgments about that, that can be the beginning of, of a sort of philosophical journey that's uh, full of hope. Thank you, Dr. Hibbs and Dr. McInerney.